If you've spent some time writing software tests or refactoring your code to make it easier to manage, you'll certainly have used dependency injection. What this allows you to do is separate creating a resource from using it, which is great because it nicely decouples your code. However, there's a next level, which is dependency injection frameworks like Inject, or even FastAPI has a built-in dependency injection framework. The question is, what do these things actually do? And why do we need them? That's what I'll dive into today. If you like these types of discussions, you might also like my weekly newsletter, where I share the latest news in the software industry and keep you updated on what's happening behind the scenes at Arian Codes. You can join for free by going to my website, ariancodes.com. What exactly is dependency injection? In principle, it means that we supply an object to, let's say, a function, instead of letting that function create the object itself. That way, you can separate creating the thing from using the thing, and that allows you to better decouple your code. Let's take a look at a very simple example. So I have an almost empty main file here, but let's say I'm going to add here a data class, and then I will define a class user, which has a name and let's say an age. And then I'm going to define a function that does something, and this creates a user. And for example, what we can do is user.age and then let's say we add one to the age and then we print the user. And then from the main function, I call do something like so. So if I run this, then, well, this is what we get. John is 31 years old, right? Pretty straightforward. Let me drag this over here so we can more easily see it. Now, the thing is that do something currently creates a user object, John, and does something with the user and this precisely illustrates the problem with not injecting your. Now, the issue is that do something only works at the moment with a very particular user, namely John. If we wanted to work with another user, well, we're going to have to edit the code right here. We can't simply let it work on another user. And that's at the core, the problem that dependency injection solves. So instead of defining the user here inside the function, we can also move that somewhere else and then pass the user as a dependency to the function. And then here, of course, we need to pass it as an argument. So now, of course, when I run this, this is gonna have exactly the same result. But the nice thing is that do something can now be used with other users as well. So for example, I can create a second user, which, well, let's not name this user John. Let's say we're gonna name this user Arion. And Arion is also age 30. It's not true, by the way, but Let's pretend it is. And then I'm going to call do something on user two. And I can do that without having to change anything in the actual do something function because I'm supplying user as dependency. And that's at the core what dependency injection is. So we separate creating the thing, which is what we do here, from doing something with the thing, which is the body of this function. So that's dependency injection. And what's really nice about dependency injection is if you do that consistently throughout your code base, then you're going to end up with basically one place where you patch everything up, one dirty place in your code. That's where you create the specific objects and you uh, make links between these objects and then you can keep the objects and the functions themselves pretty generic. And that's actually nice because you can also combine this, for example, with abstraction by not accepting a user class, but a protocol class that then implements certain methods or has certain instance variables. So dependency injection allows you to do decoupling of your code much better. So you might wonder, okay, so fine, then let's just use that and be done with it, right? But there may be some cases where you want to do a bit more with your dependencies. For example, especially if you're using frameworks like FastAPI or Django, this is often the case that you want to sort of standardize the way that dependencies are dealt with. In REST API, for example, you quite often are going to depend on a database connection because your API will work with the database. So it's nice if there is a standard way to do that sort of dependency, to inject that database dependency so that when other people use your code or work on your code, they immediately understand that there is a dependency on the database. So standardizing things. Another thing that you might want to do is that for some dependencies, you might want to have 
more explicit control over the life cycle, like what happens when you open and close a database connection, for example, or uh, how many instances you create of some class or things like this. These are examples of where dependency injection library might be helpful. Secondly, if you're using frameworks, FastAPI has an actual built-in dependency injection mechanism, which is quite useful in the context of REST APIs. So ultimately, the aim of that is to standardize and make dependency injection more consistent versus just doing it yourself on the fly in your code. So I want to show you two examples of how you can use this in practice. The first one that I want to show you is a dependency injection library called Inject. I have an example here, and this uses a combination of Inject with data classes and Pydantic to show you a couple of different use cases. One of the key features of Inject is that it allows you to define on the one hand how instances should be created, and on the other hand, how it should be injected into your methods or functions. And you use decorators for that. So in this case, for example, we have a repository class for various types of objects in your database. And we have a create table method that allows us to initialize the table containing documents. And what I'm using here is the inject.params decorator that allows me to define what we're going to pass as an argument to this particular method automatically. In this case, that's a SQLite cursor. And what I'm doing in this case is nothing more than executing this create table SQL query. And then when we create a subclass of this repository, like here for blocks, for example, then I define what this query is supposed to look like. And I've set up a couple of other methods as well. For example, creating a new item, getting an item, updating an item, and so on and so on. And each of these gets a SQLite cursor. So it uses the cursor to access the database. And then what Inject allows you to do is to configure how those objects are supposed to be created. So in this case, I have an init function that gets a specific database connection. So I create that in the main function. And then in inject.configure, I define how these different types that are used, these different dependencies that are used throughout the code need to be initialized. So for example, if you have a SQLite database, there is a cursor function that provides a SQLite cursor. And if you use bind.provider, this allows you to specify for a SQLite cursor how that object should be created. And that's by calling the cursor function from the database. Or what you can also do is that if you need a blog repository dependency somewhere that you simply define what object that's supposed to be. So this will create a single block repository instance and then pass it along as a dependency to all the functions methods where you define that as a parameter. So for example, here I have an all blocks function that gets a block repository and then returns the result of the all method call. So as opposed to your boring homemade dependency injection, this allows for a lot of flexibility in how objects are being created and how they're being injected into your functions and methods. Quick question though, is this something that you're considering using in your Python projects? What would you say is the main use case for this? Let me know in the comments. So what's the purpose of setting up all of this dependency injection stuff? Well, the nice thing is that once we've configured inject and configured how dependencies are being injected, we can actually call these functions without supplying the dependencies. So if I look in the main function, so for example, here I'm calling create table and create table is defined here. You see it expects a blog repository, but when we look at the main function, see we don't supply one. And that's because the dependency injection framework takes care of supplying that dependency. And the way it happens, we configured in the inject.configure function call. So this is the power of dependency injection. So you specify this once in the configuration, and then when you use these functions and you call them, then the dependency is injected automatically. And same thing for other function calls, like there is also create block, for example. So if you look at create block, so it accepts a title content and a block repository. But since we have specified how the dependency is supplied, we don't need to supply an actual block repository. We can simply call it as is. And this is one of the main advantages of using a dependency injection framework. So we can now write code that doesn't require us to think about how we are going to provide access to blocks because that's what the dependency injection framework 
took care of. Another example that I want to show you where dependency injection is quite commonly used is in FastAPI. And like I said at the start of the video, FastAPI also has a standard way of dealing with dependencies. And in this case, what I've done is, again, very simple database, just using a SQLite database here. And I'm using a blog model. So blog has an ID, title, and content. And I'm using some pedantic models in order to be able to create and read blocks. Now, where the magic happens in terms of dependency injection in Pydantic is that there is a depends function that does that job for us. So this is part of FastAPI, it's built in. And what you can do is I have a function here called getDB that supplies a database connection. And on top of that, what I'm doing is that I'm using a generator here. So this yields the database, but then once it's no longer needed, in the finally part, it will close the database connection. And this is nice about try and finally, finally is always executed. It doesn't matter if there's an exception or not. So the database connection is now always closed. And the way we supply the database connection as a dependency in our fast API endpoints is by simply adding it as an argument and calling the depends function. So this is a very easy way of supplying dependency to your endpoint. And then fast API, just like what the inject library does will inject the dependency automatically for us. We don't have to think about that. So then we have it here and then we can simply call methods on it like adding and committing and refreshing or whatever we need to do with the database. So in this case, we supply a function to the depends function. You can also supply a class and then it's going to create an instance of that class for you. So depends is a very useful mechanism to inject the dependencies. And one of the nice things of using FastAPI's dependency injection mechanism in this is that when you need to write unit test for your API endpoints, then you can actually replace the database with a mock database connection and then write tests for them. That's pretty easy to set up. On top of depends, FastAPI also has a couple of other standard things it can inject, such as the request or security. By the way, if you enjoy coding in Python, you might also enjoy my free Discord server. You can join via the link below. There's lots of like-minded people there talking about coding, software development in general. It's a really fun place and I hope you'll join. So in this video, I've shown you a couple of examples of dependency injection frameworks, whether that's a separate library like Inject or something that's part of another library such as FastAPI. Personally, I think in the case of a framework like FastAPI, using dependency injection in a standardized way makes a lot of sense. It results in more consistent code that's also easier for others to work on. It allows to write unit tests more easily and replace, for example, database connection with mock database. So I think that's very valuable. Now, using a specific dependency injection library like Inject, personally, I haven't found a real use case for that in my own code. I typically revert to simply supplying the dependencies in a very basic way and just adding them to the function. And I haven't really felt the need for using a dependency injection framework like Inject, but maybe you have a different experience. If you have, please post it in the comments. Now, one place where a dependency injection framework might be helpful is logging. I've encountered this quite a few times where I'm trying to figure out the best way to supply a logging object to my various functions. You know, you want to log something while you run the function, but then do you really want to pass each time a logger as an argument to the function, which just makes your function arguments more complicated or the alternative is that you actually import it from another file, but then your code is coupled to that file. So if you want to use it in a different place, then you have a problem basically. So that's where I think the dependency injection framework might actually be a good solution. So it would in that case automatically add a logger object when you call the function. And then in your configuration, you can specify what that logger should look like. So that's something that you define on the top level. So dependency injection frameworks haven't used a lot, but I might actually start using it for logging. So I hope this video gave you an overview of what you can do with dependency injection and dependency injection frameworks. Now dependency injection, in particular, separating, creating things from using them, is just one aspect of doing object-oriented programming well. I did a video a while ago where I covered several tips that help you write great object-oriented code. You can watch that right here. Thanks for watching and see you next time.